All right, for just a brief recap to kind of set the scene for moving forward, we've talked in uh, more recent uh, lecture videos, we talked about the Dakota War, sometimes called the Dakota Uprising, which mostly took place in Minnesota and involved Minnesotans, uh, Minnesotans uh, being uh, Anglo-American citizens uh, who lived there and the native people who lived there, specifically the Dakota Sioux. If you recall that uh, that war essentially started when the promised food for the Dakota was being uh, withheld by a government agent who was selling it on the black market. So uh, there was this bloody war in Minnesota which ended with the largest mass execution in American history when almost uh, 40 Dakota warriors were executed for their role in that, uh, in that war. Now, uh, bear in mind, these are the Dakota Sioux. There are three basic branches of the Sioux, uh, the Dakota, the Nakota, and the Lakota, a little farther west on the plains. That happened in 1862. And then we also talked about the Colorado War, which uh, was in 1864 and 65, and involved mostly Cheyenne and Arapaho, but also some of their Lakota allies, particularly from the Oglala Lakota, uh, fighting uh, against settlers in what is uh, uh, now the state of Colorado and uh, the state of Kansas and a little bit uh, even to the north into into Wyoming. It was during that war that the infamous events at Sand Creek took place in Colorado. If you recall, that is when a peaceful Cheyenne en encampment led by Black Kettle was attacked by Colorado militia who killed a large number of men, women, and children, and horrible, absolutely horrible degradations were committed upon them. Now, there's a reason I just did that, that recap. So, like I said, I was setting the stage. Here we have a map that shows the various plains tribes, uh, the tribes of the northern plains, the southern plains, and where north and south come together in the Central Plains area. And you can see where the Lakota are located there principally. And of course the Dakota Sioux over there in Minnesota and into North and South Dakota. The, uh, the Dakota being relatives essentially of the Lakota, a different branch of the, you know, of the Sioux. And the result of that Dakota war was that the Dakotas were removed from their home territory and dispersed to several reservations in surrounding states. And the Cheyenne and Arapaho were the closest allies of the Lakota. So here you can see that uh, much of the Central Plains, the North Central Plains, dominated by this alliance between the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, other than uh, what is now the state of Nebraska that was controlled by the Pawnee, as well as Ponca and o Omaha. Uh, up to the uh, northwest, you can see the longtime traditional enemies of the Lakota and Cheyenne, the Crow. And here is where that Colorado War took place, 1864 and 65. Cheyenne and Arapaho, yes, but also quite a few Lakotas. Now, here's my point. The Lakota Sioux were upset about what happened to their kinsmen uh, to the east, the Dakotas. They were also upset about this Colorado War, which they participated in, particularly, particularly like uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho, uh, what happened at Sand Creek. So, uh, again, this is setting the stage for the end of the Civil War, at which time the Lakota Sioux had plenty of reason not to be very trusting of the United States government.
And all of that leads directly into another major war, actually a much bigger and more major war than the Colorado War, that is, uh, is usually referred to by historians as Red Clouds War, also sometimes referred to as the Powder River War or the Bozeman War. Uh, officially started in 1866, although we're going to look at some things that led up to it. And most of it happened in the Powder River country. So as you look at the map right here, the Powder River, uh, you can see it uh, starting there uh, in, in Montana. And it comes down into Wyoming and goes near uh, Fort Reno there. Uh, it's not far from the Black Hills, which of course are which of course are sacred to the Lakota and the Cheyenne and the, uh, the Arapaho and various other tribes as well at different times. Well, here's the, uh, here's the background. All right, so during the Civil War, actually uh, right in the middle of it, uh, 1862, uh, there was gold discovered uh, in, in Montana, uh, up in the mountains, there, the, the first gold strike was just west of Virginia City. So you can see that very mountainous area there in uh, southwestern Montana, northeastern uh, Wyoming. Well, as you can imagine, when, when gold is discovered, you know what happens. People start pouring in. Uh, and you'll also notice that the Oregon Trail that we've talked about so much there at the, near the bottom uh, going right through the middle of Wyoming uh, was there. And we know that a lot of people had come come through that route. You'll see that it passes, uh, the Oregon Trail passes right by Fort Laramie that we've also talked about a lot. Well, um, there were various ways to get to the gold fields up there in Montana that would have bypassed uh, Indian Territory, Lakota Territory, but, uh, but they, were, they were kind of long routes. So this guy named uh, John Bozeman in 1863 blazed a trail, established a trail that was an offshoot of the Oregon Trail going uh, northwest. And you'll see that it passes right there through the, um, through the Powder River country and goes up to uh, Bozeman Pass. Uh, which is a way in which you can get up into those mountains ending in Virginia City. Well, technically, technically a big portion of that trail, and you can see the Bozeman Trail there in yellow, according to the 1851 uh, Fort Laramie Treaty, remember that one? Uh, the treaty that the U.S. government had with eight different Northern Plains tribes, in which essentially the U.S. government assigned territories to each of the tribes and drew boundaries and said, here is where your tribe is. Well, according to those maps, a lot of this was in Crow territory. Uh, however, things had changed since 1851. The Lakota had been expanding. They'd been expanding westward, and they had sort of pushed the Crow farther west, uh, northwest, up into Montana. Now, from the perspective of the U.S. government, that was a violation of the boundaries set in the 1850 Fort Laramie Treaty. And according to the Crows, because they were, you know, they were on the receiving end of it, uh, it wasn't a good thing because they had lost uh, access to, to that territory. But from the perspective of the Lakotas, and probably it would have been the same from the perspective of, of the crows, if the shoe had been on the other foot. What, what are lines on a map? Um, lines on a map are, are meaningless to these, these people who are, especially in the, the plains, the northern plains, generally pretty mobile, right? So the, the territorial boundaries, uh, land was not owned and boundaries weren't written down and laid out on maps. So, you know, what did it matter? Well, uh, the crows weren't too happy, and neither neither was the U.S. government when this trail went up and all those miners started taking that shortcut to get to the gold fields. Now, 
For, for several years previous, I said that the Lakota had expanded westward. Uh, well, there was, there was friction between the Lakotas and their traditional enemies, the Crows, and there probably would have been anyway. Um, one one Oglala, Oglala warrior in his uh, winter count on his teepee, his, basically his, his calendar, his chronology, uh, he, he mentioned the years between 1857 and 1863 uh, in, in, in reference to how many uh, people got killed on each side. So like one year was the year the, the Sioux killed 10 crows, and then the next year was the year the crows killed eight Sioux, and so on. Well, eight Sioux, 10 crows, or the other way around, whatever. It's a big difference between that and the 3,500 approximately miners who came up the Bozeman Trail between 1864 and 1866, eating up the game uh, and passing uncomfortably close to the sacred Black Hills. It may, uh, it may have occurred to some of them uh, that if not for those pesky Lakotas up there, it might be interesting since there's gold in all the other mountains. Maybe there's gold in them there hills, but it would be uh, be about a decade before anyone was able to check that out. Anyway, here come all these miners, uh, and the, the Lakota started attacking them along the road. The U.S. government responded by building three forts along that trail. Uh, the Crows gave them permission to build the forts in their territory, and technically the, the territory where it started there by Fort Reno, according to the 1851 Treaty, boundaries was Crow territory. So they said, sure, go ahead. Uh, Lakota is not too happy about that at all. So friction continues to intensify and raids continue to be made on these miners and settlers who are coming in behind them and setting up uh, farms and homesteads in, in these territories. Well, the, uh, the U.S. government called a, a conference of the tribes, of the leadership of the tribes at Fort Laramie. Uh, and a few people showed up, but none of the ones who were attacking anybody, none of those bands, uh, the bands that didn't really have a vested interest in it, and that didn't really help. So eventually, they convinced Red Cloud, who was one of the principal leaders of the Oglala Lakota, and several others to come in, and they were in the middle of negotiating uh, and offering, actually, they were offering the Lakota some significant uh, um, uh, financial incentives to allow these miners to pass through the territory. Uh, right in the middle of that, when all of a sudden, here comes a huge contingent of U.S. infantry and cavalry and start building those forts, which did not seem uh, like a, a real propitious uh, thing uh, to the uh, negotiations so far as the Lakota and their allies were concerned. So basically, they, they just went home. So they, they left Fort Laramie and went up uh, into the hills. And before you know it, there were, uh, there were skirmishes between the cavalry that were now assigned to those forts and the, the Indians, in this case, the Lakota, and their Cheyenne and Arapaho allies. Now, the Crow, who didn't like uh, Lakota or Cheyenne or Arapaho to begin with, and hadn't for a very long time, and were really ticked off at them at this point, um, they got in on the action by volunteering to help the U.S. Army and serving as, as scouts. So throughout the remainder of this war, the U.S. Army had Crow scouts, and that would still be the case a decade later when other wars would take place in this area. So here are those basic facts, where it happened, when it happened, and uh, who was involved. Of course, the U.S. government and their Crow Scouts on the one side. On the other side, Northern Cheyenne, Northern Arapaho, and Lakota. And remember, the Lakota were divided into seven bands a couple of those bands had been involved in the Colorado War. Pretty much all of them get in on this one. So the bands include the brulee, which is a French word for burnt, uh, the uh, 
uh, that band's name for themselves is the Shichangu Oyate, uh, meaning the uh, the burnt thigh people. The Ogallala, the Hunkapapa, the Minikanju, the Sans Arc, which is French and means without bows. Um, the Shihasapa, the black feet, and the Oohe Numpa, also known as the two kettle people. Here are some of the principal leaders on the native side in this war. Of course, you have Red Cloud, for whom the war was named. Uh, that's him right next to his name there in the picture. Um, Red Cloud, one of the principal Oglala leaders at that time. Uh, more about him in a moment. One of the most uh, uh, distinguished and the, the principal, uh, one of the principal leaders of the Cheyenne was Roman Nose, we talked about earlier. Another uh, significant leader from the Minakanju was Hump, and several from uh, several more from the Oglala Nation, Crazy Horse, whom we've talked about, and also, and this this becomes a little convoluted, American Horse, um, who's uh, well, American Horse the Elder. Uh, there is an American Horse the Elder and an American Horse the Younger, that. Uh, happened to have the same name. Uh, the older American horse was born in 1830. The younger one was born in 1840. And uh, both of them were principal leaders uh, here in, in this war. Uh, the one that we have pictured in the upper right, that is uh, American horse the younger in his older years. We don't have a photograph of American horse the older. And the name that both of them had uh, that was translated by, by the, uh, the white folks as American horse uh, was actually Washichu Tashonka, which probably would be better translated as white man's horse, indicating that, you know, they got the name by stealing a white man's horse. Um, then you've got uh, pictured here in the lower right, young man afraid of his horses which is also kind of confusing because there is also an old man afraid of his horses. Um, both of them are named man afraid of his horses, or at least that's the, the translation that the Americans gave. Uh, and they were father and, and son, um, the, the older one and the younger one, and both of them were, were active, active here at this point. Now, um, man afraid of his horses, that sounds, that's a funny sounding name. I remember the first time uh, that I encountered uh, this when I was reading about the uh, Sioux when I was probably, you know, nine years old, uh, thinking that was uh, that was just hilarious. Well, it's it's not actually meant to be hilarious. That's that's a mistranslation. Much like Crazy Horse, is kind of a mistranslation. Spirited Horse might be better. Um, the actual name that these two guys had uh, is better translated. They're afraid of his horses, or they're afraid to see his horse. In other words, when the enemy sees his horse approaching and they know that he's the guy on it, they immediately get scared. But uh, like a lot of these, like a lot of these native names that get uh, lost in translation, uh, they wound up stuck in the history books as "man afraid of his horses," the older and the younger. Now, here's where it gets a little more convoluted. Um, the elder American horse and old man afraid of his horses were brothers. They were brothers. They were both sons of Smoke, usually referred to as Old Chief Smoke in the, uh, the history books from, from the era, um, who was one of the great leaders of the Oglala Band. He had been born in 1774, so, you know, he was in the prime of life when Lewis and Clark had passed through way back, you know, in 1804, 1805, around in there. And he only passed away um, right around the time that all this was starting in 1864 when he was 90 years old. Well, he was a very, very prominent, highly respected leader uh, in fact, um, they say that his his war bonnet and each feather in in the war bonnet uh, 
was uh, representative of an act of courage, uh, each, each individual feather. He had so many feathers that it was like the largest war bonnet that anyone had ever had, that it trailed down behind him, not only to the ground, but trailed behind him on the ground, and he was six foot five. Red Cloud was the nephew uh, by birth of Old Chief Smoke. I think he was uh, the son of uh, one of Smoke's brothers who died in battle when Red Cloud was little. So his uncle adopted him and raised him as his own. This means that Red Cloud and American Horse the Elder and Old Man Afraid of His Horses uh, were considered to be brothers. And that would explain why, uh, you know, being the sons of the most prominent chief ever of the Ogallala and Lakota being um, patrilineal, that they would be right there uh, not that there's uh, such a thing as hereditary leadership, but just being in that family gave them gave them some uh, respect, and and also you know, just imagine the things that they they had been taught. Now, when this war, Red Cloud's war, was over, there were four um, four Ogallala leaders named as shirt wearers, uh, which is the highest possible the highest possible office and function of a warrior outside of outside of chief. It was uh, uh, the, the chief military honor. And when earlier when I was talking about Crazy Horse and I, I talked about how his various deeds there during the Colorado War led to him becoming a shirt wearer, uh, well, I, I was a little premature there, I guess, because it was those things that first brought him to distinction and then his, his actions in, in this war, which came so close on the heels of the other one, it was like the same war, really. So uh, the four shirt wearers who were appointed in 1868 after the treaty was signed, basically this is like getting medals when the war is over, were a crazy horse, American horse the elder, an old man afraid of his horses, and another Ogallala whose name was Man That Owns a Sword, uh, he hasn't. Uh, he he wasn't documented as well in the in the history books, but uh, these are these are the some of the principal leaders on the side of, of Red Cloud in the fight. This next incident takes place just uh, just near Fort Phil Kearney, which is is shown on the map here, but isn't named. It's the red dot in the middle, next to the creatively spelled Fetterman Massacre. So you've got three red dots along the Bozeman Trail in that little section, Fort Reno to the south. Uh, the one in the middle that's not named here is Fort Phil Kearney. And to the north, you have Fort C.F. Smith. At the time that the, the fighting started, Fort Phil Kearney wasn't completely finished. It was still being fortified, if you will. So... The, uh, the fact that they have to have more wood for construction, plus their wood needs just for fuel, uh, as well as they need hay for their horses, is, uh, uh, well, those are going to be two logistical problems that, that have to be solved by, by the U.S. Army there at Fort Phil Kearney. Um, because this area is uh, in, in this, this place where there's not very many trees at all. So they had to travel a ways outside the fort to get to wooded areas to cut down trees to bring back for further construction and the other things that they needed. There was also a large hay field uh, where they grew the uh, particularly tall grass for, for their horses uh, that was just a little bit north of the fort. So the construction the, the, the logging and the, the hay mowing, all that stuff was done not by soldiers, but by civilian contractors. So civilians would be hired to come there, essentially live at the fort and go on these, uh, these short trips to either get wood or get hay or whatever. And soldiers were assigned to go with them, squads of soldiers to protect them. Well, uh, that was obviously necessary because there's a war going on with the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. 
and they were frequently making raids. And these, um, these small parties going out to, to cut wood especially were frequently attacked. And they went through quite a number. They went through dozens of civilian contractors and uh, some soldiers, too, that were, were there to protect them, being killed and or wounded. Well, killed and or wounded. Killed or wounded. Um, so so that, was, uh, that was an issue. Uh, and so uh, reinforcements were called for for the fort. And uh, something had to be done. Uh, these, uh, these squads need to be a little bit larger. And that's what brings us to the, uh, the situation at hand. The U.S. military commander of the forces there along the Bozeman Trail and of all three of those forts was Colonel Henry Carrington, who was by training an engineer. He didn't have any military, he had military experience, but he had no combat experience. However, he was very well connected politically, which is how he got uh, probably how he got this uh, fairly prominent position. So he's there. He's got three forts. He has about 400 men. He's commanding the uh, 18th Infantry. He's got about 400 men at Fort Phil Kearney, about 100 men down in Fort Reno, and about 200 up at Fort C.F. Smith. And uh, he had lost, uh, as I said, over two dozen, over two dozen woodcutters and, and several of his soldiers. And he had requested reinforcements, and those reinforcements had come. Another 200 men sent by General Philip Cook, uh, not Crook, that's a different, different general. Uh, and uh, among those was this guy on the left, Captain William Fetterman. Now, Fetterman did have combat experience in the Civil War. And uh, he had, uh, well, he had the opinion that Carrington didn't really know what he was doing. He thought that Carrington was too, too timid. Now, what had happened is that after they got these uh, forts established <clears throat> there at Fort Phil Kearney, uh, some Cheyenne had come to the fort. Uh, several uh, several uh, leaders, including a Cheyenne leader named Two Moons and one named Morning Star, who was known by the Lakotas as Dull Knife, and they had come there to, to inform Colonel Carrington. The, essentially, they said, you know, hey, we're, we're not involved in this. We're sitting this out. We're not at war with you, not our group anyway. Uh, but uh, some of the other Cheyennes are. And essentially, they told him, you need to, you know, you need to be careful because these are, uh, this is a dangerous place, you know, and, and it's a dangerous situation. And not far from here at this spot, at this very moment, they said, Red Cloud has got about 500 warriors. Uh, so, uh, Colonel Carrington was trying to fortify, make the fort stronger, get ready for the winter, uh, and rather than going out uh, and, and chasing after these Indians. In fact, some of the soldiers he had lost uh, had been lost due to them basically being fooled by, uh, by tricks on the side, uh, on the part of the, uh, the Native Americans who sort of drew them out one way or another. And so he had given Captain Fetterman the order when he sent Fetterman out to protect some woodcutters uh, not, to, not, not to go beyond the, the distant ridge, uh, essentially uh, far out of sight of the fort where they wouldn't be able to quickly be reinforced, but to stay relatively close by. Now, Fetterman thought that was just ridiculous uh, in fact, he said, and this is a direct quote, why with 80 men, I could ride roughshod through the whole Sioux nation. Uh, 80 men is how many that he had. So with my 80 men, I could ride roughshod through the whole Sioux nation. That didn't mean that you know, he was saying he could take a, take a sightseeing tour. He meant he could basically beat them all with his 80 men. Well, I wonder if he should ever get the opportunity to try that how it would turn out, as fate would have it. Why, it, while he was going there to, to protect the woodcutters, he was, he was distracted by a small group of, of warriors, uh, just a handful in the distance. And they stood, up, they stood up on the backs of their ponies and mooned 
the soldiers and yelled at them derisively. Uh, so uh, Fetterman just forgot all about the woodcutters and took his 80 men and rode straight for that group of Indians. Now, one of them, one of those Indians, the one that was uh, leading this uh, little expedition, was the Oglala uh, Lakota warrior Crazy Horse. And they were, in fact, trying to draw Fetterman farther away from the fort. So the Lakotas uh, ran away, and the, the soldiers came, came chasing after them. The, uh, the Indians were on smaller, faster ponies, and they were able to outdistance the soldiers, but they didn't want to outdistance them too much. So every few minutes, when they, when they started pulling a little too far ahead, uh, Crazy Horse would actually stop his pony and, and, and get off and check his hoof like there was something wrong with his hoof, you know. Uh, and then just before the soldiers got in rifle range, he would jump back on the pony and he and his men would take off again, uh, leading them on a merry chase right over the edge of that ridge. And lo and behold, what do you know, Crazy Horse had a bunch of friends there. Remember, uh, remember Dull Knife had come to the fort and warned Colonel Carrington, better watch out, Red Cloud is right near here with about 500 warriors. Well, he was. And all those other chiefs that we listed earlier, why, they all had about 500 warriors too, about 3,000 altogether. So Captain Fetterman, this is one of those rare things, you know, where you, you make, a, uh, make a boast or make an assertion and get a chance to prove it. So he said he would ride roughshod with his 80 men over the entire Sioux Nation. And as it turned out, he and his 80 men rode some, well, they rode straight to some place they weren't expecting to go, and none of them came back. Uh, hence hence the, the, the name of the, the battle, the Fetterman Massacre. Here's another map that uh, can give you a, uh, an even clearer idea of where these things are happening. Those are the three forts right there, Fort Reno, um, Fort Phil Kearney, and Fort C.S. Smith. Notice how close all this is to the Little Bighorn River. We're about, uh, about 10 years before Little Bighorn will enter the national lexicon, but it's in the same neighborhood. All right, so also you can see here, uh, there's where the Fetterman fight happened just outside Fort Phil Kearney. And a couple of other fights that we're about to talk about, the Wagon Box fight and the Hayfield fight. And you can see the uh, official treaty territory of the various tribes, which uh, the Lakota and the Cheyenne and Arapaho really uh, didn't pay any attention to. That's the, uh, that's the boundaries that the U.S. government had marked out for them. Now we're going to talk briefly about weapons, and you'll see why in just, uh, just a minute or two. At the top there, you see the 1863 Springfield rifle. That is the uh, standard weapon used by the uh, U.S. infantry during the Civil War, the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. Confederates used one practically just like it called the Enfield the big difference being that the Springfield was manufactured in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the Enfield was, was bought from British manufacturers. Either way, um, the, uh, the Springfield that was used during that uh, Civil War period was a muzzle loader, and you know how, how that works, right? It shoots one bullet at a time, and you have to uh, stand the gun straight up, and you have to drop the bullet into the barrel, and then you drop the powder into the barrel, then you take out the ramrod, which is that long, long, thin rod that is uh, underneath the barrel there. You pull that out, and then you shove that down the barrel uh, with the gun still standing standing up, or if you're lying down as far up as you, as you can get it, and you tamp it down, tamp down the bullet and the powder with that long rod. Okay, so this took about 20 seconds to, to reload. So, using one of these, a soldier could fire about three rounds per minute. Now, these are the weapons that uh, Fetterman's, uh, Fetterman's men that the 18th Infantry had uh, 
at, at the Fetterman fight in December 1866. So they were horribly outnumbered, and they were, uh, well, they were going to lose regardless. But it didn't help that whenever they did fight against the Lakota, and the Cheyenne, and Arapaho, uh, they had these they had these weapons that took so long to load and fire. Okay, so even if the numbers were even. So far as uh, soldiers versus versus Indians, some of the Indians had guns like this. Most of them did not at this point. Most of them had bows and arrows. And a, a trained archer, which, you know, a, a native warrior on the plains would be a highly trained archer, could probably fire a minimum of 12 arrows per minute. So one of the uh, lead balls that's fired out of this Springfield rifle is going to hit you a whole lot harder than an arrow will. And it probably will cause more damage. But in the time that you fired one of those, uh, one, one uh, native warrior would have fired four arrows into you. So you see where that's a disadvantage. Well, in the summer of 1860, in the summer of 1867, um, there were, there were new, a new shipment of, of weapons arrived at Fort Phil Kearney for the soldiers under the, uh, under the command of Captain Carrington to use, and it was the new updated model of Springfield rifle, the 1866 version which, if you're looking at it here, uh, looks a lot like the 1863 Springfield. You can, uh, other than the fact that uh, the, the photograph is a little bit lighter in one, you can hardly tell them apart from looking, other than the fact that right there on the top of the 1866 Springfield, there's more little gadgets in front of the hammer, uh, and uh, that includes the loading mechanism. This is what makes the Springfield superior to, well, the 1866 Springfield superior to the models that were made in the years before that. Now, it's still only a one-shot rifle. You still have to fire once and then you have to reload before you can fire again. But you don't have to do that whole ramrod business. Uh, what you do, it's called, it's called breech loading. You don't, you don't load it at the barrel. This thing, this, this extra little bit of equipment that's on top in front of the hammer just lifts up and you can set a bullet down in there and then close it back and you're ready to go. You're ready to fire again. This means instead of three bullets per minute, a soldier using one of these, if he was well trained and was good at it, could fire 10 times in one minute. So you can imagine that makes a significant amount of difference. Although, again, for Fetterman's group, um, outnumbered more than 30 to 1, I don't know that it would have helped a whole lot, but it might have. Uh, so anyway, that, uh, that, that changed after Fetterman got killed, so it didn't help him any. But the other soldiers uh, that were under the, uh, under the overall command of Carrington wound up with these 1866 versions. Now, underneath that, you see the Spencer rifle or the Spencer carbine. And those are two different things. Basically, the Spencer carbine is a smaller, lighter version of the Spencer rifle. It's a little bit, the barrel's a little bit shorter. It's easier to handle. And the uh, Spencer carbines were made specifically for the U.S. Cavalry. So at this time, actually before this time, toward the uh, uh, end of the, uh, the Civil War, and uh, into 1866, the uh, cavalry had the Spencer carbines. Uh, infantry, though, still had the one-shot weapons. Well, uh, the Spencer has, uh, has this advantage. It is not a single-shot weapon. It can actually fire seven times before you have to reload it again. The bullets are loaded into this tube, and you can see there in the diagram the, uh, the butt plate at the very back end of the rifle, that thing unscrews, and then you stick this tube in there that's loaded, preloaded with seven bullets, 
and then you screw the uh, the thing back on, and you're ready to go. And the uh, trigger guard is a lever mechanism to basically uh, advance the next round. So with one of these, you can fire about 20 rounds per minute. So you're going to have to change the tube a couple of times in that one minute period. But you can see where that is an even bigger advantage than the others. Now, the soldiers that were uh, operating out of those three forts in 1867, they didn't have Spencer carbines, they weren't cavalry. But many of the civilians, the civilian contractors that were hired to cut the wood, mow the hay and so forth, many of them owned one of these things, the rifle version, usually not the carbine because that was for the army. So many of them carried Spencer rifles. And if you had a few civilians with, with these things, that could significantly add to your firepower. Now, it's almost as if I were talking about this and talking about ways that you could add to your firepower that Fetterman didn't have, almost as though something were going to happen uh, in which that's going to come to the fore. And indeed it does. In fact, two somethings happen. Around August the 1st, 1867, there were about 1,500, maybe more, Native American warriors gathered along the Little Bighorn River. And they were deciding uh, what to raid first. And there were two very tempting targets that their scouts had told them about. They knew, for example, that not very far away at all uh, at the... Uh, uh, the hayfield, that there was a contingent of, of civilian contractors guarded by some soldiers that were there mowing hay. But at the same time, there, there knew that there was also a squad of soldiers protecting a group of, uh, of lumber, lumbermen, lumberjacks basically, that were going out to, uh, to cut trees not too far from Fort Kearney. So which one to go after? Well, they decided, why not just get them both around the same time? So they just divided their forces. And the Lakotas went southward toward Fort Kearney uh, to get the people in the, uh, uh, the, the timber patrol, as it were. And the Cheyenne and Arapaho headed for the hayfield. There were 21 soldiers at the hayfield protecting nine civilians who were cutting hay. However, um, they had taken, they'd been, they had been uh, working in this area before. Okay? And they had previously built a little mini fort uh, with a little mini stockade uh, that provided like a, uh, a fort grounds area. So this was about probably, you know, five, six feet high. Um, that stretched around. It wasn't huge. There were a few tents in there. And so the workers would be out in the surrounding area cutting hay, but if they saw if they saw Indians coming, they could run and jump over this thing and get inside the enclosure and at least have the enclosure and at least have some cover. Uh, so anywhere between 500 and 700 Cheyenne and Arapaho did come swooping in on them. And the soldiers and the civilians did manage to get inside this area and try to hold the Indians off. Now, the soldiers had the new 1866 Springfield uh, rifle that was a breech loader uh, that they could load very rapidly compared to the guns they had had previous. And <clears throat> most of the civilians had Spencer rifles. So they were able to hold off that huge number of Indians by rapidly firing into them. Uh, and the, uh, the, the attacking Indians gave up pretty quickly after they had lost some people. Now, overall, there were about three killed on the U.S. side and four wounded. And uh, among the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho, accounts vary, by which I mean the white people said they killed 23 Indians. The Indians said, no, you only killed eight of us. So it's probably somewhere in between. So not a huge number of lives lost altogether even, nor even on the Indian side. But it was enough uh, 
to convince them they needed to fall back uh, and, and to retreat. And the, uh, uh, the soldiers and their civilian charges here were able to successfully defend themselves and keep from getting wiped out. The next day, August the 2nd, the Lakota warriors attacked the woodcutting detail near Fort Phil Kearney. Now, they had done something similar. They had prepared sort of a mini fort for themselves, but instead of uh, building it sort of from scratch, what they had done is they had taken wagons, uh, just the, the bottoms of, of wagons, the beds with sides on them, and made a ring of those. You can see the soldiers standing uh, inside that, uh, that ring. So uh, they used wagon boxes in essence. Uh, and when the, uh, when the Lakota attacked and there were hundreds of them, maybe as many as a thousand, it was with very, very similar results to the Hayfield attack the day before. In that on the US side, there were seven killed and six wounded on the Lakota side uh, there were about six killed and six wounded, according to the Lakota, according to the, uh, according to the guy in charge of the soldiers, they killed like 60 or maybe 160 Indians. It was very unbelievable and unlikely. Uh, so this probably was just like the hay, uh, Hayfield attack where they killed just enough of them that the Indians saw that uh, these guns were going to have a very devastating effect, so they withdrew. Now, in both the Hayfield fight and this that came to be known as the wagon box fight. And this one is the more famous one, maybe because just the idea of, <clears throat> you know, fighting in wagon beds uh, it stands out more. I don't know. But um, both these cases, the U.S. Army side, the squads, managed to avoid being massacred. And that counts as a victory, really. Any day you don't get massacred was a good day. Uh, so... They were able to hold out, and this really showed the advantage that technology can add, because with this shift, this what might seem a minor shift in technology, added an enormous amount of firepower to the U.S. Army. Two very important treaties were signed in the late 1860s. The first one, that we'll look at took place in 1867, October 1867, on the Southern Plains, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, which actually is three separate uh, treaties, but it's usually referred to kind of rolled into one because it was to end the same conflict. That is the uh, conflict we talked about earlier, where the uh, Comanches and their Kiowa allies and the uh, Plains Apache, also known as the Kiowa Apache, and the uh, Southern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho had been, uh, had been raiding uh, along the, uh, uh, the Santa Fe Trail uh, in New Mexico, West Texas, and, and in that area. Well, uh, this treaty, uh, in this treaty, the, uh, the various tribes conceded all their land claims in Kansas and Colorado and agreed to be removed to Indian territory, what is now Western Oklahoma, onto reservations. So one treaty was with the Comanches and Kiowa together, a separate one just for the Plains Apache, and then another separate one for the Southern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho. Uh, so that the uh, Southern Cheyenne, Southern Arapaho wound up on the same reservation as did the Comanches and Kiowas. Now, the dog soldiers were a different story. Now, the dog soldiers, you will recall, was one of the military societies of the, uh, of the Cheyenne that had first been established in the 1830s and wound up being uh, very popular a lot of warriors wanted to join it, and it got really big, so big that in, in many ways it could be considered its own separate band. Uh, not surprisingly, since this is a military society made up of people who um, uh, really wanted to be, to, to be known for their military exploits, uh, they, did not, uh, they did not 
abide by this treaty. They did not agree to this treaty, did not agree to give up their hunting rights in Kansas and Colorado. And they kept hunting there, and they kept conducting raids there on, on settlers and on soldiers whom they, uh, they believed were trespassing on, on their territory. So Southern Cheyenne dog soldiers, they keep fighting. Also among the Comanches, the Quahati Band that was led by Quana Parker, also called Quahada, uh, led by Quana Parker, uh, they had been planning to be among the Comanche bands who came to uh, a Medicine Lodge to sign this treaty, but uh, there was an outbreak of smallpox uh, among their band. And so the, uh, the leadership didn't make it in time to the uh, signing of the treaty, so they never signed it. So after all this was established and the uh, other Comanche bands agreed to go to uh, Oklahoma and be confined to a reservation, the Quahati band said, well, we never signed anything. We weren't there. So they refused to acknowledge uh, that that treaty applied to them. And they stayed in their, their region in the uh, Llano Estacado or the Staked Plains of West Texas. But as for the other Comanche bands, they all, uh, their, their leadership all signed. And that meant the end of the Comancheria. Uh, they really, they handed over their um, empire, almost, uh, and agreed to, to all come together to this reservation in Oklahoma. Ultimately, they wound up at uh, Fort Sill. So what did they get? There was a whole wagon train of supplies promised to them, but it didn't get there for a very long time, and that first, first winter especially was really hard. They ultimately wound up around... Uh, uh, I think the Fort Sill area. Uh, in the uh, Northern Plains, Red Cloud's War came to an end with the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Now, there was an 1851 treaty. Remember, that's the one where those eight different Northern Plains tribes had signed on and agreed to allow safe passage to uh, settlers along the Oregon Trail, uh, agreed to let the army build forts, all that stuff. This is a different Fort Laramie Treaty. They are both very important, and they both get mentioned a lot in uh, discussions of uh, the, the Northern Plains, but also the discussions of American Indian history in general. So the 1868 Treaty, the, uh, the combatants on Red Cloud's side, that is the Lakota, the Northern Cheyenne, and Northern Arapaho, uh, they agreed to stop being combatants. They, they agreed to stop fighting. And what the U.S. government did was they acknowledged that the U.S. was, was in the wrong in the, uh, the whole issue, that the war had been provoked by all those miners. Remember, there were about 3,500 of them who had uh, encroached onto uh, Indian Territory in the Northern Plains on their way to the gold fields along the Bozeman Trail. So the U.S. admitted that's what started the war, and the U.S. agreed to not, uh, not allow it any further, not let it happen. They closed down the Bozeman Trail. So at that point, after that point, you wanted to go to Montana, you wanted to go to Bozeman, Montana, you wanted to go to the gold fields, for whatever gold might have been left by that time, you had to take the long way around. You couldn't take a shortcut through Indian country. So uh, the Bozeman Trail is closed. Uh, there was an admission of culpability and a guarantee that all three uh, tribes, so Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, would be guaranteed hunting rights throughout the Northern Plains, including that area that the 1851 treaty had marked out as being Crow territory. So uh, they were allowed to continue hunting there. Also, the United States government guaranteed the safety of the Black Hills, which was, of course, sacred to all three of these tribes. They guaranteed that there would be no encroachment of the Black Hills, that the Black Hills would be off limits for non-Indians uh, 
and that the government would enforce that. That makes this, this treaty and this war, Red Cloud's war, very significant. Um, when we talk about wars between the U.S. government and Native Americans, it, it usually, uh, usually ends badly for, for the Indians, always does in the long run. But in the short run, it usually ends badly. Sometimes there might be a battle won, like the Fetterman fight, uh, but the war would ultimately be lost. This is one of the very rare cases where the Indians won the war. Essentially, they got everything that they had been asking for. They got, uh, they got peace on their terms, which you know, is, is really unusual, sadly, but it did lead to peace on the Northern Plains for almost a decade, for about eight years, um, until the same thing happened that ended the peace of the original 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty. Gold discovered in 1876 but uh, that's a story for a little bit later.